So this is Extreme Makeover Ruby Gems Edition. Um, I'm basically going to talk about uh, what happened to Ruby Gems in the last year and what we're planning on doing in the near future. Um, I am Andre Arco. I'm indirect on all of the internet things. Um, I work at Cloud City Development, a mostly Rails but general web development shop where we build apps for people. Um, so let's get started. Um, Ruby Gems. Lots of stuff happened this year. Um, it was a really eventful year for Ruby Gems. Um, the infrastructure changed a lot, and mostly in good ways. Um, so the, the first, huh, kind of stretching the definition of a year to last October, um, the first thing that happened was Bundler kind of DDOS rubygems.org. Um, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Arguably my fault. Um, we basically couldn't tell that it was happening until people slowly installed Bundler 1.1, and more and more and more of them installed Bundler 1.1, and eventually it was enough people that RubyGems couldn't handle it anymore, and it died. Um, so the dependency API that Bundler was using turned out to be really CPU intensive compared to the like not very CPU intensive delivering a file um, that was happening without the API. Um, so I gave a talk at Gotham Ruby this year, actually, just a few months ago, um, with a lot of detail about that particular situation and what happened and what we learned from it and what we did about it. Um, it's online if you guys really care about that particular thing. Um, the TLDR is that we rebuilt the API as a Sinatra app that's now hosted on Heroku separate from rubygems.org, and we throw an unbelievable amount of CPU and database resources at it in comparison to like what we had before. Um, the next relatively significant thing that happened was there was a security breach of rubygems.org in January. Um, their gems have YAML gem specs, and Rails at the time provided a way to use YAML to exploit against the running application. Um, so someone uploaded a gem to rubygems.org that contained crafted malicious YAML, and the server executed it, and they got uh, access to the server. Um, like, I think they paste binned a copy of the Etsy passwords file. Um, it was pretty bad. Uh, as a result of that, Potentially, any gem on rubygems.org could have been replaced with a gem that had a Trojan in it, and we didn't really have a way to tell just from the server logs because they could have been tampered with. So um, the rubygems.org team, mostly Evan Phoenix, uh, kind of exhaustively compared every gem that we had to copies of those gems that had been taken by mirrors of rubygems at other times before the uh, exploit had happened. Um, Happily, it turned out that all of our gems were fine and no one was screwed. Um, yay. Uh, but we didn't really have a way to trust the box that rubygems.org had been hosted on again. Um, not too surprisingly. Uh, so as part of the process of rebuilding everything from scratch, uh, we actually rebuilt everything on a new architecture that's more flexible. Um, we're on EC2 now, um, we have redundant servers, we have maybe possibly hopefully failover if some of those servers stop working. Um, it's all managed by chef recipes. Uh, honestly, I think it's way better than the setup that we had before. Um, the chef recipes are open source. Anyone can contribute fixes or features to not, before you could contribute fixes and features to rubygems.org, the Rails app. Now you can contribute fixes and features to the servers that rubygems.org runs on as well. Um, the refill is on GitHub in the RubyGems org named rubygems-aws. Um, and that's actually pretty cool. Like I'm, as, as frustrating as this was at the time, I'm really happy with how things turned out and how things are better now. Um, another issue that plagued a lot of people was Travis network issues connecting to rubygems.org. Um, like, I don't know if all of you guys know what Travis is. It's an automated continuous integration system. Um, lots of open source projects use it because they will provide uh, server-side continuous integration testing for free for all open source projects. Um, Bundler uses Travis super extensively to test on every Ruby version and every RubyGems version to make sure it still works. Uh, 
for a few months, it was basically a crapshoot whether you could actually install gems on Travis. Um, you could try like 10 times, and sometimes eight of those tries would work, and sometimes one of those tries would work. And it was really, really frustrating, and basically no one knew what the problem was because everyone said it was someone else's fault. Um, there was, a, I don't know, kind of on and off investigation. Um, it turned out that the problem was actually DNS. Uh, the Travis virtual machines had hard-coded DNS servers that were on the opposite side of the country from the data center where the Travis VMs actually ran. Um, <laughs> that meant that whenever RubyGems tried, or actually, so RubyGems hosts gems on Amazon's S3 service and then sends you to CloudFront, which theoretically gives you a server that's geographically close to where you are. The problem is it uses your DNS servers to know what geographically close to you is. Um, that meant that the Travis servers looked to CloudFront like they were on the other side of the country, and they were getting told to use CloudFront servers that were about as far apart as it's possible to be while still being inside the United States. Um, that was not optimal. <laughs> uh, it, once we actually figured out that that was the problem, um, Travis was able to sort of force their DNS servers back to ones that were actually inside the data center where their, their VMs were hosted, and that basically just went away. Um, it's not perfect, there's still, like, it's still like a very heavily contended connection to RubyGems, but because there's like so many jobs running at the simultaneously, but it's way, way, way better. It's now like nine or 10 times out of 10, it succeeds. Um, the other, equally frustrating and equally intermittent problem that uh, happened to RubyGems this year, uh, kind of semi-concurrently with the Travis issues and then continuing after that was SSL issues. Um, if you have done a lot of gem installing, you have probably seen SSL errors and been like, I don't know why this happens. And sometimes they just go away if you try again, which is like the worst possible kind of bug. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, it turned out to actually be two different bugs. Um, there was one issue that was kind of a combination of different certificate problems. Um, some, like so, some Linux machines don't ship with a new enough uh, certificate to verify the rubygems.org certificate, and so we had to add the appropriate certificates to rubygems and bundler so that on machines that didn't have it, we could verify that rubygems.org was the machine that we thought it was. Um, there was another certificate issue in that some S3 endpoints started using a newer SSL certificate, which meant that what we'd done to fix that was now semi-invalid, but it was kind of random which S3 endpoint you got, so it only sometimes failed. Um, so we also updated the certificates again to like fix that issue. Um, and then super frustratingly, at the same time, there was a different SSL issue where if it, it turned out eventually to be that if you were on a laggy connection, uh, rubygems.org would just stop responding to your request to open a connection if it took a little bit too long. Um, the timeout was very short, just like a few seconds. Um, and so the SSL, like what you would see if the server said, nope, this took too long, kill it, was an SSL error <laughs> um, because the SSL connection had never been finished setting up. Um, so we increased the timeout, and that also has basically made that problem go away. Obviously, it can still happen if you're on an incredibly laggy connection, but we set it to something more reasonable that means almost everyone succeeds almost all the time now, um, which is great. Like, it's so much better. <laughs> um, so that's kind of like a review of the significant things that happened. Uh, now I'd like to talk about how RubyGems works and how I am working on changing it to work differently. Um, so, right, how it works today. Uh, today, both Bundler and RubyGems download gem information from rubygems.org. Um, there's basically two ways to get information about gems. Um, you can either ask rubygems.org for the list of all the gems that exist, um, or you can ask the Bundler API for just a like named list of gems. Um, Honestly, neither one of these is that great, <laughs> um, but they both work. Uh, 
so we keep using them. Um, when you run gem install, uh, Ruby Gems downloads the list of all of the gems and then looks for the newest version of whatever gem you asked for um, to find out what it is. Uh, when you call bundle install, it will first try to use the API um, and only ask about the gems that are in your gem file and then the gems that those gems need and then the gems that those gems need and then the gems that those. So can need a lot of requests. Um, both of those options like are pretty memory intensive because you end up with, like if you download the whole list, you end up with a list of every gem that exists, even if you didn't actually care about any of those gems, just the one. Um, so with a fast connection, it's not that bad. Um, you can download the whole list of every gem pretty quickly. You can make lots of requests to the Bundler API pretty quickly. And either way, it's tolerable. Um, it's not great, but everyone's pretty much okay with it. Um, the problem is rubygems.org and the Bundler API both live in uh, AWS's US East zone, which is in Virginia. Um, that means that if you're not in the United States, you don't have a fast connection, the end. <laughs> um, if you're like in Europe or Asia or Australia, God forbid, um, <laughs> it's gonna take a really long time. Um, it, it's not as bad if you're just downloading the whole list all at once, um, but then you have the like, this is a, it's like multi-megabyte file and then you have to unmarshal, it's, it's a, it's a big file with arrays of gems, and then it's marshaled into the Ruby Marshall binary format. Um, and so you have to unmarshal the entire list and then look through that list for the gem that you actually cared about. And that can use up way more memory than it needs to and way more bandwidth than it needs to. And if you're using Bundler, you've probably just made 50 round trip requests to Virginia. And if you're in Australia, that took forever. Um, so, definitely could be better. Um, this is not the fastest situation. Um, so, basically after setting up the new Bundler API system earlier this year, um, it, it took us probably a month to get the replacement up after everything went down in October. Um, and then kind of after that, uh, I spent, I don't know, several, several conferences worth of time uh, talking with the rubygems.org team members, the rubygems team members, and the Bundler team members, and we kind of like all pooled our ideas for how to make this less bad. Um, and I kind of aggregated all of them together and sanity checked the overall ideas with everyone, and we have a plan. Um, it's relatively straightforward, but it's a pretty big departure from how we've been doing things up until now. Um, so, Instead of using marshaled arrays, we just have a plain text file that lists the gem names and the versions of the gems. Um, you can parse plain text files with like split. You don't have the dangers of Marshall or YAML or have to worry about the file changing from the beginning to end just because you added a single thing to the end of the list. Um, those are all benefits. Um, it's really easy to cache plain text files. It's really easy to, you know, like copy them around and look at them, and it's much nicer in general, I think. Um, happily, we figured out a way to use plain text files that is very, very, like, within 5% as fast as the current Marshall format, so pretty good. Um, so once we have that plain text format, we can make some improvements. Um, we can cache those files on the client. Um, because it's broken down into individual pieces, uh, you know, like each, each gem has a file that lists all of the versions of that gem and all of the gems that those versions depend on. Um, and then there's like a master list that tells which gems, like tells you about all of the gems that exist. Um, so because those files are separate and small, uh, we can say, hey, I'll just keep these here on my computer and I won't need to re-download them every time. Um, because right now, both RubyGems and Bundler re-download the entire list of gems from scratch because it might have updated uh, and we had no good way to incrementally add to that list with the format that we already had. Um, 
that also reduce, like, so that the, that obviously reduces the size of the data that gets transferred, but that also reduces by a lot the number of requests that have to be made, um, because you can do things like check to see if new gems have been pushed since the last time you ran, and if you get the response that's like, nope, no gems pushed, then you don't even have to check to see if any of the individual gems were updated, you just know that they're all up to date. Um, so less response data and less requests means faster for everyone, but it will definitely be significantly noticeably, like, it will be noticeably faster in the US, but it will be incredibly faster outside of the US. Um, right along those lines, to speed things up even more, uh, we're going to add CDNs in front of basically everything. Um, right now, the way that the architecture works is all requests have to go to AWS in Virginia to find out where to get the data from. Um, and that works for gems, works for gem specs, works for the uh, gem index file itself. Um, so everything will be CDN. Um, I, the, uh, the CDN company Fastly volunteered to uh, both provide engineering resources and an account. Um, and so we're going to have the gem specs, the gems, and the gem index files, which right now are not cached in a CDN at all, um, available just from Fastly, which means that when you make a request from Australia, assuming that the file hasn't changed, Fastly will just give it to you from a server in Australia. You won't have to, like there will be no requests that happen to the US until the Ruby gem server tells Fastly, hey, there's a new version of this file. Um, that should remove all requests that have to span the world to install gems, and I'm hoping that that will make all of the international Ruby is super happy. <laughs> um, the final part of the improvement plan is to provide easy to install and use local mirrors of Ruby gems. Um, right now, this is basically a nightmare. Um, it's super hard to do, and it's not uh, a combination of the way that it works right now and no one having spent a huge amount of time on it means that the options basically boil down to, hey, you should just put a varnish or squid cache in front of Ruby gems and hope that that does what you want. <laughs> um, so we are, like, as part of this plan, we're building out the app that currently provides the Bundler API to also act as a local mirror of Ruby gems. Um, so you'll be able to spin up a copy of that inside your data center near your machines and like we're, we're working with tra the Travis guys to get this set up inside the Travis data center. Um, various other companies that run enough boxes that install gems that they're like, you know, if, you're, if you either care about this performance wise because you have a lot of machines doing a lot of gem installs or you care about this from like a paranoia perspective where you want to have copies of all of your gems yourself inside your data center even if rubygems.org is gone, um, this will allow you to do that. Um, and it, we're hoping to, although it's not done yet, have um, scripts that will let you just like run this on a, an out-of-the-box Ubuntu VM or run this on uh, you know, like whatever internal setup you have super easily. Um, so after I hashed out all of this plan and wrote it down and said, this is what I'm gonna spend my free time working on for the next, whatever, six months or a year, 10 years or however long it takes to do this. Uh, <laughs> Ruby Central uh, said, hey, that actually sounds like a really great idea and we would like to give you a grant to work on that. Um, so I got a grant to work on that. Um, for the last few months, I have been working uh, one or two days a week uh, paid by Ruby Gems to implement that plan, which is pretty awesome. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm really excited about that. Like, it's super great that Ruby Central thought that this was worth doing, and I am really happy to have been working on it in that time. Um, I just want to let you guys know what we've been able to do so far and kind of where we're at. Um, so there had been like a couple of different stabs at a new index format by various Ruby Gems team members, but nothing that was like super solid or that was actually getting used. Um, 
I spent the first probably month or so working on the index format and making sure that it worked and contained all the information that we needed and uh, was you know, like usable across both RubyGems and Bundler and could be created on the server and all that stuff. Um, and then started implementing it. Um, so like right now, the, the Bundler API Sinatra app can actually serve the new plain text index format, like, and it works. Um, it's really great. Uh, there's, I, I have a prototype implementation in Bundler that lets Bundler install gem files using only the new index format um, from only the, you know, like from a server that only speaks the new index format, which is pretty sweet. Um, along with working on this, we, you know, kind of like in that same time period, uh, I worked with the rubygems.org team on the SSL issues that I'd previously mentioned to figure out what was going on and get those resolved. Um, we've also worked with Fastly and the rubygems.org team to actually get, uh, it's not the entire plan, but right now gems and gem specs are actually hosted by Fastly and uh, we've, we've asked international Rubyists to benchmark this change and it's been a huge improvement. Um, so we're part of the way there on the CDN thing, which is really great. Um, so having made it that far, here's what we have left to do. Um, rubygems.org is going to, but does not yet, serve the new index format. Um, RubyGems itself is going to use, but does not yet use, the new index format. Um, and we're going to get all of those files pushed out into Fastly so that no requests have to go to the RubyGem server itself unless they're a cache miss on the CDN. Um, so at that point, once we have done that, um, everyone installing gems, everyone using Bundler, everyone using RubyGems uh, will be able to benefit from all of those changes. Um, that's pretty exciting, actually. Um, <laughs> basically, like, at that point, uh, no matter which, like, gem installing client you're using or how you have, you know, like, the server set up, you will be able to use the new index format, get your data from Fastly, and make as few requests as possible and just get to the business of actually installing gems. Um, so uh, let's talk about what that means for the future. Um, I am really excited about this plan. Like, I, even in my uh, prototype rudimentary testing, it is way faster. Um, I am super, super grateful that the RubyGems team and the RubyGems org team and the Bundler team have all like been helpful and supportive as I've been working on this. Um, Ruby Central has obviously been paying for some of this work, which is super awesome. Um, kind of more immediately in the future, um, there is a pre-release version of Bundler right now that doesn't include the new index format yet. Um, Instead, it includes a parallel installation, um, which is another huge speed increase that we've been working on. Um, if you install a pre-release version of Bundler and then call bundle install with dash J and then a number, it will spin up that many processes or threads to install your gems. Um, if you have like four or eight cores, this can make a really significant difference in how fast your entire gem file gets installed. Um, Heroku and Travis are both testing this change and will implement it uh, like system-wide once the release is final. Um, that should make both deploys and CI runs noticeably faster, which will be pretty great. Um, as soon as this version is out as a final release, um, I'm going to move into the pre-release cycle for the version of Bundler with the new index format. Um, it's it's almost baked enough to be a pre-release, um, and I'm kind of like parallelly splitting my time between getting the work that we've already done out and working on the new stuff. Um, once these release, like once this release is out completely, um, I will ask everyone to try out the new index version of Bundler and probably will have to fix whatever has gone wrong that we didn't notice, um, but it's like, real soon now is basically the answer. Um, that said, there is a lot of work left to do. Um, like, obviously, like, there's 
ongoing RubyGems and Bundler maintenance as Ruby moves forward and as RubyGems moves forward, we have to like keep all of them in sync and working together. Um, so there's ongoing compatibility work. There's um, working on making Bundler faster. There's working on making all of these things work together to be an awesome new system like we've planned. Um, even with the Ruby Central grant, I'm still only able to work on this like two days a week. Um, the volunteer teams that work on RubyGems and Bundler and RubyGems.org have been super helpful this entire time, and we could totally use more help. Um, if any of you are interested and able to help us out, um, definitely hit me up. Um, I will pull you into the next generation Bundler group, and we can try and get things worked out so that it happens even faster. Um, that's it.